Okay, we're gonna talk about The Legend of Korra, with major spoilers for events from Season 3 and 4. There won't be anything from the comics, before or after, alright? Alright. So, in Legend of Korra Season 3, we are presented with this hipster Chad Zaheer. Zaheer is composed, humble, loving, with a genuine sense of solidarity with the oppressed. And he's kind to our main protagonist as well, Avatar Korra. He's also a radical political agent who, after escaping custody, assassinated the tyrannical Earth Queen, orchestrated the societal collapse of the Earth Kingdom, which was a side project on his way to essentially kill God. We don't know much about his backstory, but we get a solid look at his philosophy. I'm going to be talking about him and the organization he's affiliated with, the Red Lotus, as essentially synonymous for the purposes of this video. So, Zaheer is ideologically an anarchist, and is both described as and describes himself as such. He's not a fan of world leaders and states, and sees them as institutions for disempowering the will of the populace, if not outright oppression. While not one himself, he strongly culturally emulates and respects the pacifist air nomads, who were a decentralized community of monks who dedicated their lives to seeking enlightenment before they were all killed by imperialists over a century ago. Yeah. Zaheer is more than just an anarchist in the etymologically literal no-government sense. The ocean of anarchism contains a lot of varied ideologies, not all of them agreed upon. It's less of a position of being anti-government and more multiple broad threads of principles that manifest into different ideals. Some general themes within anarchism are an oppression to unjust hierarchies, capitalism, and the state's monopoly on violence, and support of direct action, mutual aid, and solidarity with the oppressed. They also have a strong history of anti-fascism. Zaheer's particular flavor of anarchism is implied to include a destruction of class divide, freedom of movement, and even prison abolition at the very least. More specifically, Zaheer could roughly be described as an insurrectionary anarchist, more a classification of tactics and praxis rather than ideology. Insurrectionary anarchists believe nothing short of performing direct attacks on institutions of power and are hostile to negotiating with or compromising with said powers. They seek nothing less than to tear oppressive systems down through whatever means are available. There's a lot of ideological nuance to what attack means in this context, but that's the gist. These are the anarchists people typically imagine as dangerous autonomous cells of armed revolutionaries. And while that isn't the only shape they can take, they do generally resist forming formal groups as they believe that makes them vulnerable to being co-opted and losing sight of their subversive goals. They don't really want to be integrated into the existing status quo. It should be noted that insurrectionary anarchists don't necessarily argue everyone can or should operate the way they do, just that at least some minority must for change to happen. Zaheer opposes institutions that impede the freedom of those who live under their boot of power, and rejects the right of world leaders to amass political power to use to oppress unwilling citizens. Zaheer isn't for chaos itself so much as freedom against institutional coercion and abuse. This applies to governments as functionally institutions that enforce laws and borders through police and prisons, in practice creating a vertical hierarchy of both power and wealth. Anarchists, meanwhile, call for horizontal self-organization instead, where, for Zaheer, where a man's only allegiance is to himself and those he loves. We can see this in how he has nothing but respect for the restored air nomads on political principle despite them ostensibly having a degree of hierarchy, as he does not appear to consider the role of mentors and spiritual guides oppressive. And we're also shown that care is taken by their organizer, Tenzin, to ensure that the new air nomads join entirely of their own volition. Ahem. After some hiccups. This positions Zaheer as an unusually credible portrayal of anarchism. He actually supports tearing down oppressive hierarchies and rising above them. The line he crosses that puts him into conflict with our main protagonist, however, is that he considers the titular Avatar as part of that oppressive hierarchy. The Avatar is a messy metaphor for many, many things over the course of the show. Most plainly, in simple terms, they are a seemingly random individual fused with the primordial spirit of order, with the spiritual role to ensure the world remains in balance, reincarnating again and again to take up this mantle in successive lifetimes. The Red Lotus's original plan was to bring the world back to this so-called natural order that existed before the Avatar, where the primordial spirit of order, Rava, and Chaos, Vatu, were locked in endless combat, with spirits free to roam the world. Thus, the Red Lotus's criticism of the Avatar is suggested to include the new world order that the first Avatar, Wan, created. 
namely dividing the human spirit worlds and allowing human society to grow beyond the limits placed on them by the spirits. It's unclear what ultimately would have become of the Avatar as the vessel for Rava if their original plan had succeeded. Regardless, with Vatu having been destroyed by Korra, their plan shifts to killing the Avatar spirit outright and Rava with it, effectively removing both Rava and Vatu. No gods, no masters! The Avatar's power over others has two main components, their sheer physical might and the cultural legitimacy of their judgments. The Avatar easily has the potential to be the most physically powerful human being on their planet, capable of leveling whole armies. And while others can control at most one element, the Avatar can bend all four. In addition, their superpowered Avatar state has repeatedly been made akin to a last-ditch cheat code to force political adversaries to bend to their demands. Even so, they are not immortal and omnipotent. This is discussed as part of their role. Their weakness and mortality is important to allow them to stay connected to the people they are serving, and the Avatar's sheer physical ability to win fights has never been a given, with many different avenues having emerged to undermine their apparent power. Zaheer isn't living out some Harrison Berger on parody. He never remarks on the Avatar being too physically authoritative, nor considers bending elements itself inherently oppressive. The Avatar's social role is the real threat here. The social role of the Avatar is complicated. They seem to be a stand-in for many things, but more or less every culture and society in the Avatar universe acknowledges the Avatar's right to, by force if necessary, mediate and override others to ensure a more just world, to act as the socially recognized arbiter of balance. We see this most plainly with how history will judge the results of conflicts negatively if the Avatar isn't the one to right the scales with their spiritual authority. This is alternatively regarded as harmony, peace, balance, but don't mistake this for neutrality. The Avatar chooses sides based on their moral judgments, and different Avatars have had different values, leading them to make different judgments. Historically, as a geopolitical force, the White Lotus seems to have been organized to help guide the Avatar's moral and spiritual development, to ensure that they would act in the interests of all. Once identified, the fledgling Avatar gives up their worldly possessions and journeys to experience different cultures and worldviews, with the hope that the Avatar will serve as a force for justice and harmony in the name of all people. Despite this, we've still seen the Avatar's capacity for unjust violence and abuse of their power. So if nothing else, it is an imperfect system. Of course, the two examples we have the most information on didn't have typical Avatar journeys, but even Avatars that did made choices with massive negative consequences in retrospect. While the Avatar is a reincarnation of the same being, that doesn't make their value system any more inherently just. And it's not as if the universe suggests that these decisions are more objective or active and invaluable or even consistent. They were, and in many ways still are, just an ordinary person. And yet, their institutional legitimacy to deal out violence and regime change is not confined by anything, and they remain a product of their time. While young avatars can oppose their own society's injustices, grown avatars have been shown forming cozy relationships with those very institution of powers, whether or not they are growing an oppressive system. We have seen avatars take the side of cops and agents of state violence against the people, and it seems like the later lives of avatars becomes one of maintaining their preferred status quo. As Tenzin notes, the Avatar is not a politician. They don't have to worry about approval ratings of the people they act upon. But to an anarchist, wielding institutional power over others' agency itself is the problem. Zaheer's argument is that a single individual shouldn't have deciding authority over the will of the people as a representative of justice and balance, and that the Avatar's power can easily be abused by its very nature. The thing is, in this universe, the Avatar is the correct person to put your faith in as the moral perspective of the narrative revolves around them as the main character. The original series leans on this consciously when it discusses the Avatar giving people hope, that without the Avatar, there would be no way to win, as if the world, through the existence of an inherently moral world order, will write itself on its own through the Avatar. And the history supports this reading too, as the Hundred Year War is heavily suggested to have only gone on so long because the Avatar wasn't there to stop it. The entire premise of the original series relies on the notion that if the Avatar is defeated, the Fire Nation de facto has won the war. An anarchist could say that the Avatar's cultural existence is doing harm here, as positioning themselves as necessary for justice, that putting your collective faith in external saviors disempowers your own ability to demand and believe in a better world. This is among the common criticisms anarchists make of representative government and voting more broadly, that having an icon you rally around as a savior does more to diminish your own agency rather than empower it. Note that I'm not suggesting that this is the writer's intent, just that this is one way you can read the story. The show itself criticizes this kind of learned helplessness 
in the episode The Painted Lady, with the kind of oppression that can be individually accepted while putting your faith in others to save you. The previous Avatar Aang and his group are also seen much more rallying people to rise and participate in direct action rather than asking others to put their complete faith in the Avatar alone. Later, Toph goes so far as to criticize how conceited the very notion is, pointing out that the Avatar is no more capable of solving evil than anyone else. Supporting this, we are shown that when Avatar Korra is out of commission for a couple years, plenty of other agents in their world rose up to take the mantle of bettering the world, suggesting maybe we don't actually need the Avatar, and without one, other individuals would simply rise up to take more responsibility of their world regardless. As for Zaheer's critique of the world governments themselves, we are spoiled with options. Zaheer cites plenty of examples of the failed governments and hierarchies on the show. During the Hundred Year War, the Fire Nation government is pretty unambiguously monstrous as the antagonists of the original show. They commit genocide, colonialism, imperialism, ecocide, all backed by a hereditary divine mandate to rule that is ultimately not even narratively challenged. But things don't get much better geopolitically in Korra's time either. Take the group responsible for imprisoning Zaheer for 16 years. The White Lotus has embraced so much structure and hierarchy that instead of ensuring the Avatar experiences a varied worldviews, they sheltered the Avatar in a compound, making her alienated from the struggles of those she's meant to protect. This was a decision made by her father in response to Zaheer, passed down from the structure that came out of the White Lotus openly serving the previous Avatar. Essentially transforming the White Lotus from a secret society safeguarding culture and spirituality who played a pivotal role in opposing the aforementioned Fire Nation into prison guards for both the new Avatar and the Red Lotus, who formed in direct opposition to the White Lotus's abandonment of these principles. There's also the United Republic, made up of former colonies of the Fire Nation, putting to the side the massive injustices we see in the non-Bender Revolution, injustices that are explained as simply the wrong people being in power, and the solutions involving no systemic change to prevent them from happening again, Zaheer intends to assassinate the United Republic's president, Raiko, who consistently is shown incapable of any choice that goes beyond short-term security for his, and only his, people, even if it would essentially cause the destruction of the whole world. And of course, there is the Earth Queen herself. Tyrannical, arrogant, and cruel, the Earth Queen is everything Zaheer hates about government. She lives in a massive palace, using her power to seize money from the poor to fund her excess and imprison and enslave anyone she sees fit to. Hell, they suggest she eats baby animals for fun. She also is furious at the United Republic for taking her land to make their own empire, which is probably an unintentionally, hilariously self-aware sentiment if ever there was one. Going so far as to call her citizens her property and making the capital bossing say effectively a police state. The here moving to assassinate her is hardly a surprise. One interesting little detail we see within Bossing Say is that transit from the upper rings of the city to the lower class rings is free, but going back up requires tickets and passports. With the quality of life being sealed off by these walls, we even see when Mako and Bolin are being told to leave, the Dai Li and their implicit threat of violence is what dissuades them. That said, for all of Zaheer's talk of moronic presidents and tyrannical queens, the Metal Clan exists as the show's refutation of Zaheer's worldview. Introduced in the same season as him, the city of Zaofu demonstrates that government can be, at least theoretically, used to enable their people's freedom and self-expression rather than curtail it. Their leader, Su Yin, is effective, experienced, and flexible. Their society is flourishing and innovative, unburdened by cultural baggage, and their people seem happy and cared for. Zaofu's government is unique in a lot of ways that agree with Zaheer. They reject lengthy, punitive prison sentences, monarchical right to rule, and as a society, do not seem to have much in the way of class divide or poverty. The monorail here is free for all. These principles lead Su to decline reunifying the collapsed Earth Kingdom with President Raiko after the assassination, seeing it as imposing herself upon the world in a coercive manner, under logic that Zaheer would likely agree with. Despite this, Zaofu does conflict with Zaheer's stated values. They have laws that are imposed on their people, and a militarized police that enforces them through violence. Yet their government and laws are portrayed as fair, and imposed equally, regardless of class or power. Zaofu doesn't map cleanly onto one ideology, but they do have elements of progressivism, social democracy, and some technocracy thrown in. While Zaofu is far from perfect, in ways I would love to dissect at length another time, it serves to challenge the assertion that states are fundamentally oppressive. All right, let's get spicy. Let's move to the biggest criticism we see against the here. That while Suyin declined to seize power after the Earth Kingdom's collapse, someone else did. The militant Kuvira, who ushered in an even more authoritarian autocratic regime than the Earth Queen, 
which is pretty impressive. The Earth Empire's rise is generally blamed on Sahir both in and out of universe as representative of real life occurrences of people's revolutions being followed by an even more authoritarian regime. That if it wasn't for him, the oppressions of the new Earth Empire would never have happened. This is used to say that Zahir's effort to lift oppression merely made oppression worse. So let's dissect how that worked. Following the collapse, the show has roving bandits laying siege to different provinces of the Earth Kingdom, and they terrorize the provinces into handing over their autonomy and resources to Kuvira for security. While Kuvira is shown recruiting some bandits, it is never explicitly stated that Kuvira was funding their assault on those city-states, although she does acknowledge that they are better funded and prepared than the city somehow. Textually at least, this suggests that the existence of the previous Earth Queen's army was safeguarding these provinces from being raided. And now, without the government and police, roving bandits are such a threat that there is no other choice. The details of what is going on with these roving bands is never explored. They go so far as to intercept the air nomads airlifting in supplies with a biplane. It's a wonder why they are putting so much resources into starving this one town. And it's a wonder where they were in the original series, where Ba Sing Se had no presence safeguarding smaller Earth Kingdom communities despite, you know, 100 year long war. Are these bandits also going hungry? Are they doing better or worse since the government fell? Who were these people before bossing say it's collapse and society caring for them? Regardless, they do serve as one way Zahir can be credibly accused of enabling Kavira, while simultaneously harming the people he sought to liberate. That, however, doesn't actually tell the full picture of what happened. Zahir didn't fund Kavira or provide her with supplies. The very people who apprehended and imprisoned him did. The international community, particularly the United Republic, through the not-assassinated President Raiko, actively sought out someone to re-establish the Earth Kingdom's monarchical rule over the continent, founded purely on the basis of their military backing and the hereditary birthright of their new, incompetent puppet king. The same United Republic and White Lotus who stood idly by as the Earth Queen terrorized her own people. Zahir may have created the power vacuum, but what crushed it was other governments demanding it be crushed. Of note, if Zahir hadn't assassinated the Earth Queen, there is no alternative offered to stop her. They certainly couldn't vote for things to change. She drafted and imprisoned her citizens, economically extorted them for her lavish lifestyle, and sicked the secret police on anyone who opposed her. All of this is suggested to be in accordance with the law, permitted, and tacitly condoned. If Zahir's actions are disallowed, essentially, she is rendered untouchable. This abuse of game theory, that the notion that we should allow tyrants to oppose their people because opposing them could make things worse, is whether we like it or not, what this argument amounts to. So reliable a logic, in fact, that it is the intentional practice among despots to have their second-in-command be even more vile to discourage removing them from power. But to many anarchists, power doesn't justify itself through holding you hostage. You don't need to agree, and the political calculus can vary situationally. But there is solid ground for Zahir's argument that fighting oppression is justified regardless of whether or not you can ensure it's replaced by something better. The criticism of Zahir also rests on a deterministic, predictable notion of history, and it needs to be shown that the way things did turn out is the only way they could have turned out. To help illustrate this, let's apply this to another example. If in The Painted Lady, Katara had been arrested after blowing up the polluting factory, and the city was destroyed by the Fire Nation thereafter. Would the lesson be that people should have just accepted the factory poisoning their water indefinitely? That we should have known that trying to stop them would only make things worse? That the factory was the lesser evil, and that surely there must have been a better, more polite way to get what they needed to have happen? I don't think so. So, we can say Zahir caused Kuvira, in that if it wasn't for him, Kuvira would never have happened in a causal sequence of events. But that is as true as saying if it wasn't for Zahir, the Earth Kingdom would never have become federated. If it wasn't for Zahir, the monarchy would never have destabilized. You can also say Zahir getting captured is the thing that made Kuvira's rise possible. But again, we are talking as if the cause and effect is more simple than it is, and reality resists being simplified. Further. Why is Zahir generally blamed for Kuvira crushing his revolution with something worse, but Raiko and the United Republic directly funding the shift towards fascism is seen as merely an extra detail? Do we judge the actions and consequences of the status quo more gently than those trying to fight for a better world? Can you think of any examples where this comes up in other situations? Now, this doesn't directly justify murdering anyone let alone the Earth Queen or the Avatar, but the narrative doesn't really make the case that murder itself is the problem, or the real evil that crosses the line ideologically. 
The protagonists have murdered, or attempted to murder, plenty of their political enemies uncritically. You can argue that there is something that makes those situations categorically different. Maybe murder is okay if they are directly going to kill people and not indirectly by ordering other people to implement policies through structural violence. Or maybe starving and enslaving hundreds of people isn't enough grounds. Nonetheless, it raises interesting questions about who we blame for things and what kind of violence we can and can't accept. And these moral boundaries aren't always as neat and obvious as we wish them to be. For all of Zahir's critique of the world, though, that doesn't necessarily mean his solutions work. While it's easy to dismiss arguments by yelling hypocrisy or just delegitimizing a compelling villain's perspective by having them also be a fraud who lied to everyone, Zahir's praxis actually tangibly undermines his goals. Zahir is solely focused on dismantling power, but what does Zahir's world look like? He has no established long-term notion of building a better society out of the ashes, and at every turn he is willing to seize and oppress others in service of his goals so long as he can justify it as temporary. Like take prisons. He's willing to use the power of having Mako and Bolin imprisoned over them. He throws his white lotus captors in prison to starve for weeks. He literally chains Korra up in a prison to die. Then we can get to like camaraderie. He's a backstabber and he kills his own people, loyal people like Aiwei, for the sake of cleaning up loose ends. If his structures of power won't protect the people who aren't useful to him, what good are they? This also applies to his most damning actions, capturing the new air nomads and reneging on his deal to free them from captivity. It isn't fully explained why exactly he does this, maybe to use them as ongoing leverage, but the air nomads were the closest organizational structure to his goals, so the decentralized society free of coercion. Imperiling them indeterminately is indefensible on any of his ideological grounds. This reflects a larger issue with his agenda. He spends no time building larger communities and movements up. He believes that rulers themselves are the cause of the world's problems, and not the systems that created them. Killing Rava wouldn't have stopped Kuvira from existing. He thinks without rulers, we would organize ourselves into a better society, as if decades of life experiences confining people's imaginations won't cause them to merely recreate the rulers that oppress them. So here's inability to do systemic analysis limits his ability to create lasting change in power balances. This is one thing Kuvira, for example, understood dangerously well which allowed her to play the political landscape to rise to power. Meanwhile, Zahir imagines his anarchist principles will manifest in the world by ripping apart the existing order with no foundation to grow from. Zahir makes a case against hierarchical government, but his methods could not have achieved an alternative. The fact that even within his own group he still participates in direct, unnecessary harm to bystanders and allies undermines that he really can imagine creating a world without abuse of power over others. He acts in ways that sabotage the very communities that he endorses. Even in the case of the Avatar, he seems under the illusion that during the time of Wan there were no prisons, inequity or oppression, that imprisoning Vatu and closing the spirit portals is what made the world change for the worse. But we've seen what the world was like before the Avatar. It was a mess of injustices back then too. And if we take pause and examine the air nomad culture he idolizes so much, their, their community didn't spring up and flourish in a vacuum. They developed and reinforced cultural values over generations that took collective work and effort to create and maintain. Work that Zahir doesn't understand takes more than a few assassinations to foster. Work that Tenzin is doing right now that Zahir needlessly sabotages. Zahir may imagine a better world, but he doesn't understand the work required to get there. He sees his only obstacle as the elimination of the current world order. But without a more robust look at the causes of injustice, how we perpetuate them, and how to build a society without them, he's rendered unable to succeed in creating anything, just tearing things down. He wants a society free of oppression, but he only understands how to topple oppressors. And frankly, that isn't enough to realize his dream of a new reality, unburdened by the monstrosities he sees in the current one.